Alright. Well, let's hang out on air. It's live. Yay! Alright. So, um, we have yet another major Jewish thinker today. We've got, we're going backwards in time now. Ah. So we had Maimonides and Rashi who were approximately, I mean, they were about a hundred years apart from each other, but they both lived in sort of the same general time frame of Jewish history. Um, even though they're, they're obviously very, very different and they're contributing totally different kinds of um, base texts, pretty much. So we're going to go backwards in time today. We're not going chronologically, and we're going um, to look at um, Yehuda Hanasi, Judah the Prince, um, who's responsible for a much earlier base Jewish text. Okay. So Yehuda Hanasi, and Nasi, by the way, just means um, prince. Wait a minute. How, do, how do you spell it? It's Yehuda? Yeah. And then Hanasi is usually in English spelled H-A-N-A-S-I. But if you want to look him up in English, he would be called Judah the Prince. Oh, okay. And so what was the time frame? So we're looking at pretty much the second century um, CE. Yeah. But that's pretty early, right? Um, yeah. We're looking in the land of Judea. Um, and we're, we're looking pretty much at the Roman occupation. Um, so the Romans, uh, pretty much the Roman occupation is like this catastrophic event that really does change the course of Jewish history in a way that is, I would say, probably one of the most profound shifts. I, I'm sure that historians smarter than me would, would take uh, exception to that. But pretty much the Romans come, and this is the second destruction, or the destruction of the second temple um, that happens around the year 70, and it starts the second diaspora, right? We had it one, the first diaspora came after the Babylonians destroyed the first temple. That's like well over 500 years before the year zero. That's the first diaspora. A lot of the Jews come back from that because only a few generations in, the Babylonians get conquered. Someone decides it would be better if they, uh, Cyrus the Great decides repatriating the Jews costs him nothing and gains him much. Um, so then the Jews are back in the land of Israel for another few hundred years. And then when the Romans come in, really everything goes to pieces. Um, so they destroy the temple, they um, enslave a lot of Jews, uh, it's the Roman conquest of the land, but then they sort of stick around for a while, and there are a lot of Jews who are still in the land during that time. So this guy, Yehuda Hanasi, um, is a leader, not the leader, but a leader um, of the Jewish community during the Roman occupation. and. This is apocryphal, as much of his, you know, what we know about him sort of has to be, because the second century CE is a very long time ago. Um, he was supposed to have been friends from a very young age with someone who grew up to be one of the Roman generals who was in charge um, of the land of Israel. Um, we do have reason to believe, quite actually, that he had really good relationships with the Roman leadership, and so. It was good for the Jews, right, that they had a leader who uh, was friendly and able to communicate well with the Romans. Okay. Um, but that's actually not why he's famous. He's famous um, primarily as the redactor of the Mishnah. Ah. This okay. is what we've been talking, right, about what makes up all of these texts. And the Mishnah is one of the first is the first uh, great text after the Torah. I think it's okay to say. So there's a lot going on to how, the, how this happens and who he is. Um, and he is incredibly famous within the world of text study. Um, this whole idea, sometimes he's referred to as the tech, in the text just as like rabbi. Referred to as what? Just as rabbi. Oh, oh. Like, he's the, you know, he's yeah. the rabbi. Uh, sometimes he's referred to as Rabbeinu HaKodesh, which means, like, our holy rabbi. Um, but he's, uh, he's known within the world of the text in these superlative terms, right? Mm. Um, 
and he's really important because he redacted the Mishnah, um, but because he was central in um, s central in accruing power to the rabbis, um, mm -hmm. and also crucial in then taking that power and then turning it and, and using it, developing uh, a popular halakha, developing rules for how people could live. Um, because as with the Second Temple gone, right, so there had already been development of popular law in addition to Torah law that had already been going on for some time. However, it was mostly oral law. Um, but the temple falls, the second temple falls, and with it, two major things happen. The first is that the Jews lose political sovereignty. They lose the ability to self-govern through a political way, right? Now they're slaves of Rome, and, and there's a, a, a power vacuum. And then second, they lose the place where they made sacrifices. Um, wow. and if you think about the reason that that the Torah, the Judaism of the Torah, the Judaism described in the Torah, um, is so different than our lived Judaism, yours and mine, is because there's a huge time gap, but also because the, the Torah was written for a temple. Hmm. All of those rules about sacrifices, all of the rules about what the priests wear, you know, we've been building the Mishkan for the last month uh, in, the, in the weekly Parsha, it's, there's just all of this stuff that we don't have, all of these rules about, you know, which sacrifices to make for which kinds of sins, and it all pretty much disappears. All, all of the ability of Jews to do those things just goes away when the temple falls, and when it's clear they're not coming back anytime soon. So now it's like, uh-oh, <laughs> if we're going to hold on to this religion, we need to make some major changes very, very, very quickly. Um, and we need some basic agreed upon rules, or we're never going to be able to be like cohesive outside the borders of our land. Um, this is what makes Judaism, I think, so awesome. Uh, pretty much no re other religion did this, right? There were lots and lots and lots of ancient Near Eastern religions, and none of them survived because the moment they were conquered, they um, they just sort of like gave up. They didn't really have anything to keep them going. So Judaism becomes uh, the religion of the rabbis. It's no longer the religion of the priests. Now it's the religion of the rabbis. Um, and so there had already been this long tradition of oral law, conversations about how to live, like, and what to do, and what the laws actually meant, and how to put certain laws and, and rules into practice in a day-to-day -day way. Um, and so what ends up happening um, is that they are collected and they begin to be written down and they begin to be passed around because these great centers of study are being built up. But they need to become one body in order to be functional, right? There needs to be actually like, this is what the Mishnah is. Um, uh, and by the way, the the Hebrew word, root, excuse me, of the word Mishnah, the Shin Nun He, has to do with repeating something. Ah. It's about repetition. Um, and so all of the um, structure that's inherent in the Mishnah actually evolved over time, right? That's why Yehuda Hanasi didn't didn't write. He's not considered the author of the Mishnah, um, because of these things already existed. His genius was to put them together in a particular way and to sort of choose what what stayed in and what got left on the cutting room floor. So there's over one, or excuse me, over four thousand mishnayot, meaning like an individual section of text. So a mishnah is the name of the whole thing. The mishnah is the whole thing, but a mishnah is like one unit of law or argument. Sometimes it's one rule, sometimes it's a couple of things, but it's this small unit. Okay, so there's over 4,000 of them collected. And we know that there were a lot that were not formally included in this great work called the Mishnah, and some of them were collected in other lesser-known books, which survived. And they're considered also authoritative, but they're not as authoritative as the Mishnah. If there's one of these other kinds of texts that survived but didn't survive within the text, 
it's legitimate as law as long as it's not contradicting anything. Um, and it follows a particular kind of structure that had actually developed over time. So Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi received this, um, like inherited this university system pretty much, the same way that if you went into a university today, you know, you don't have to invent the idea of, a, of an art history department. An art history department exists and you sort of study things that fall within that. So generations of rabbis prior to Yehuda Hanasi had sort of developed this way of thinking about it and they're called Darim or Sedarim orders. The word for Seder, like we have on Pesach, like in the Hebrew word for okay, which is Beseder, a Seder is an order. And so the original, the people who are credited with um, creating the orders are these, the um, like number one argumentative pair of the Mishnah, Rabbis Hillel and Shammai. Um, Hillel, after whom the student organization is named. So they are like the original Bert and Ernie of the Mishnah. They are <laughs> always at each other's throats. They disagree on everything. And pretty much always the halakha goes with Hillel. So it's fascinating. We have this archetype, like the first squabbling pair of Gemara, and there are lots of them after that. Um, rabbis who just like frequently show up in pairs. Uh, and they're, they, they always disagree, and obviously tradition finds one of them to be way more correct than the other, but we include both opinions. Um, and they had sort of developed the, uh, they are credited, anyway, with the development of these sederim. Um, and they fall into the following categories. So zera'im, which is agriculture, mo'ed, which has to do with the seasons, nashim, which is family, nezikim, which is damages, Kadshim, which is all of our sacred stuff, and Tahara, which is purity. So we're looking at everything from agriculture to holidays to laws regarding the relationship between men and women to what do I do if my uh, like cow stabs your cow with its horns. Um, <laughs> the, that's my favorite. Um, like ritual purity of objects and people. So it really covers like the whole, um, it covers a lot, right? It covers a, a really large range of human life, especially at the time, but also today. Um, it's very comprehensive, and so these are the original uh, breakdowns, like the volumes or the departments for debate. So those things already existed. Those were already out there in the rabbinic culture. What Yehuda Hanasi then ended up doing is sorting all of these laws that he inherited to fit into those categories. Um, I do want to mention another very famous Mishnahic pair um, that's Akiva and Meir. And they're another set of rabbis who also help shape the, the, what the eventual text is um, by sort of giving shape to arguments in the way they taught and sort of developing larger schools of thought. Um, uh, and developing even just the way that the law was discussed or the way that the law was laid out or if there was reasoning cited. Um, and so with Akiva and Mer uh, and Yehuda Hanasi, we're looking at the end, there's two major, there's a major distinction, there's two major kinds of rabbis in the Gemara. The, the Tanaim, which is like the teachers, are the ones who sort of set down the law, um, meaning they're more the rabbis of the Mishnah, they come earlier. And then we have this later group called the Amoraim, who are m more interpretive. Obviously, they're all regarded as massively important and, and their opinions are matter, but there is um, uh, there's sort of an emphasis in, in the culture of Talmud uh, and actually in a lot of Jewish religious culture that like the older the source you can cite the stronger your argument so mm -hmm. the words of the Tanaim sometimes have more merit than the words of the Amoraim or are counted in a different way so anyway this is all of the stuff that Yehuda Hanasi has to work with and we, you know I, I could say like he knew that or we know you know, but we don't actually know exactly what he was thinking but we know the result of what he did and the result of what he did was that 
all of the oral law that had sort of succeeded in, in being, even though it had begun to be written down, it hadn't really needed to be redacted into one document because the major universities and all of the thought was sort of all taking place with the same group of people in the same place. It didn't need to be spread at all. So you can you, you can play a little fast and loose when you have that, that setup. Now the Jews are all over the place. They don't have a temple. They need to figure out what their religion looks like and they need to be able to practice it in a variety of spaces, um, not all of which were quickly transversed. So now we have a thing, right? Now we have the Mishnah. The Mishnah is the curated document that is the collection of all of this rabbinic, you know, outside the temple or post-temple rabbinic wisdom. And now it's been made into a canon. Now it's a thing. It's a thing with a front cover and a back cover, you know, and nothing else is getting in. And we have all these other collections that we also end up keeping because it's valuable, but you know, the same way that like when the when the constitution was ratified by a certain number of states, like that was it. Nobody's tweaking it anymore. You know, we can add stuff on in the future, but the original text is done. That's the mission. <laughs> So he is sort of an important guy, you can see. Mm. Um, so that was most of what I had. I think. Uh, Can I use a form? The Mishnah is um, the Mishnah is much more. Uh, obviously uh, redacted, obviously edited. If you look at the Torah, you know, the Torah doesn't feel very carefully put together sometimes, um, even though it might have been. Uh, the Mishnah is redacted in this particular way, and then what's going to happen next to what's being, uh, to what this text is, what happens next to it is that it acquires all of these further conversations, picking each law apart, which be that becomes the other half of the Talmud, that becomes the other half of the Gemara, um, and that gets very, very heavily redacted, and that can sort of feel even even more um, complicated, but the Mishnah is a big step towards mm -hmm. um, towards this new system of law. And it's it starts to be the moment, you know, we talked about Maimonides and the um, hubris, ego, Hubris makes it sound like it failed, but the ego, anyway, of um, deciding that you're going to set out the rule book for all of the Jewish people, um, which is what he does in his Mishnah Torah. He sort of says, like, this is how to be Jewish, you know. Don't worry, I checked all the sources for you, even though I don't think. <laughs> um, the Mishnah is sort of also not egotistical, but it is a little bit egotistical. It's, it's this... Uh, all of a sudden, you know, we call it the oral law, and all my my student kids are always like, "Why is it the oral law?" It's mm -hmm. a book, you know, and it's like that's true. <laughs> they wrote down the oral law, um, which is also pretty bold. And then they put it out there as something that was meant to be the rule book for how to be. Um, but it's the moment that pretty much like people are given. The, the ability to make halakhic decisions through study as opposed to being endowed with the power to make rules for the people because you were born a priest. Right. Um, it's profoundly meritocratic and it's <clears throat> and the only way to get that merit is to, to be learned. Um, <coughs> that's like also the root of Judaism's obsession with education. Um, that was a question that I had, because the only value in that book, or any book, is if people read, read or have the ability to read it. So at what point, if, you, if there was a point, did the Jewish people become literate? Because um, I'm sure that... In, the, in these time frames, with ancient times, there yeah. must have been many, many civilizations or peoples who were not. Yeah. So at what point and how did the, you know, how or when did that become important for the, for the Jewish people? 
Yeah, that's such a great question, and I'm sure I'm going to screw up the answer entirely. <laughs> so the, <laughs> Maybe not. The, so first of all, the, I do think that the, the, the civilizations of ancient Mesopotamia, of which the, the, we're talking now like ancient Israelites, Venetians, mm -hmm. you know, um, they were a pretty literate bunch. They were? Um, I mean, not on a day-to-day, -day, not like everyday people, but they did have language. There are other ancient Mesopotamian, civil, you know, ancient myths, like the Epic of Gilgamesh, if you've ever heard of that. That's yeah. always pointed out as something. That's actually a text that developed around the same time that the Torah developed. Yeah. Um, you know, the Code of Hammurabi is usually cited when you're talking. So, like, they were, they were civilizations in that part of the world, much more so than in other parts of the world. But that was a civilization that always had an upper class that developed written language. Hmm. However, we're not talking about Joe Schmo on the street. And the fact of the matter is, probably we were not talking about Joe Schmo, ancient Israelite, either. Oh. But we know that even... So the first like major step in the democratization of education and the importance of it for Jews, right, is the Jews come back from... This is also according to the text itself, so who knows. But the Jews come back from from Babylon, mm -hmm. from Babylonia, and the guy who leads them back, who really sort of like is the, the pre-JNF, like organizing everything and being like, you take this kind of food and you need to take this and we're going to go on such and such a date and he writes to the emperor and he gets permission, he's organizing the whole thing, is Ezra the scribe. Um for whom the book of Ezra in the Tanakh is named. And Ezra the scribe and his sidekick and successor, Nehemiah, um, basically institute all of these changes, starting with they recognize the need for the Torah to be read out loud to the people. The people need to actually hear the Torah because most of them mm. can't read. Um, so we know that literacy is low at this point, but at least there needs to be some like literacy in the law. Even if you can't actually read it, you should have heard the words of Torah often mm -hmm. enough that you have some familiarity with them. So he institutes a policy where the Torah is read not only publicly on Shab not only in the in the temple on Shabbat, but also in the market on the two ancient market days, which are Mondays and Thursdays, right. which is why we still read Torah on Mondays and Thursdays. So Ezra kicks off this like. You need to know the law. Everyday Jews need to know the law, even if you're not a priest, even if you're a lowly whomever, like you need to have some literacy. So and then by the time of the exile, literacy is more important. We have these yeshivas, we have all of these rabbis. It's no longer a priestly class, now it's a scholarly class. Mm. Um, and there are definitely examples in the Gemara of people who don't come from particularly classy backgrounds who end up becoming great Torah scholars. Part of this is because they memorized a lot of this stuff. Mm. Uh, I mean, I think it was sort of accepted and expected that you would have most of Torah at least under your belt and then there have always there's always been this tradition of like great scholars who memorize all this stuff. But certainly they're also studying. Um, meaning reading. So there had to have been some sort of spread in literacy for, you know, there's a Gemara, there's a rabbi in the Gemara who starts off as a thief, mm. but he ends up being able to, you know, he learns to read or he, kn he knows how to read already, I actually don't remember. But it was like, you don't have to be a prince mm -hmm. to know to read. And then, certainly in, in the pre-modern era, starting at the time, starting at the time of, uh, you know, Rashi and, and, and Rambam, Jews always have a higher level of literacy than the civilizations that surround them. Almost always. Mm. Um, and I mean, I'm not, it's not 100% literacy, and, and especially because it wasn't considered important for women to know how to read um, at all. But it was still more than the civilizations that surrounded them. Jews have been hyper literate for a really long time. Um, because Everybody had to, you know, you have to be able to say your prayers. You, you have to be able to study. Um, that's like the best thing that can happen to you. Mm. And it's part of the reason that Jews end up, you know, I mean, also we're not allowed to like own land, but Jews end up in, in 
trades that require hyperliteracy, that require education. Um, yeah. Disproportionate to our numbers in the, as a percentage of the population from a really early time period. But yeah, literacy is literacy goes way back. And and before literacy, at least, you know, education in a way that it didn't necessarily exist for the surrounding civilizations. You know, the Babylonians were not out there on Mondays and Thursdays reading the Epic of Gilgamesh. Right. So is there any way to know what these civilizations who were not as literate thought of the Jews are I mean, was that a good thing or not a good thing? Well, I think it changes a lot from from place to place, and I think that there were moments when the Jews' hyper literacy served them well, and I think there were. I think it was probably. I mean, some basic facts were known about the Jews that that sort of kept us different and they, they knew we ate different things and we had you know we didn't worship the same people that they worshipped um, it's n I mean this is where I sort of become useless to you because my training is mostly in modern history and in modern history everybody's always like can you believe that the Jews give themselves one day off and they choose to spend that day at the study house <laughs> um, it's like the reaction of every European writer ever so mm. Certainly in the modern era, people are confused and also occasionally impressed by it, and, and also threatened. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know. I don't know about... I mean, there is stuff. We have some, some quotations from, you know, very unreliable sources that, like, within the Roman Empire... You know, so the Romans are very obsessed with, like, keeping numbers, and they hired Josephus, who's a Jewish-Roman historiographer who records all of their battles um, you know and everybody notices that the Jews like are very into their study houses hmm. the fact of the matter is from the moment that they like the Jews lose political sovereignty and everybody thinks that means that they sink like that they're losers you know hmm. Jews, become, Jews become the losers of history for a really long time because we are at the mercy of everybody else because we don't have our own country because we lost sovereignty um, but it's kind of a, it's it's almost like kind of, ha ha at the end. Like we sort of won. It's our private joke in the end mm -hmm. because this high level of literacy and this obsession with texts actually kept a group of people who didn't have a country for almost two thousand years, like an actual people, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty much unheard of <laughs> in world history. Right, right. Huh. Very good. Cool. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I have no idea who we're doing next time, but I think we will probably not stay in this. I'm going to open up my list, but I actually don't know if I have it here. Um, I don't know who we're doing next week, but I think we'll we'll uh stick to somebody not too modern, but we'll we'll jump forward in time from Yehuda Hanasi because I don't really have anywhere further back to go. Um, <laughs> and yeah, but good stuff. Good books. Yeah. Well thanks. thanks. So I'll put it on the calendar next week, right? Awesome. Yes, next week. All right. Thank you so much and have a great week. Thank you. You too. Thanks, Mel. Take it easy. Bye. Bye.